Evening. So Samsung's coming out with a phone that can support 5G. What's that really mean? In an article by Tech Pinions, I found some information that I found interesting. But before that, I want to apologize for the time it's taken for me to get back to this work's been just taking most of my time and mental energy, mostly the mental energy part. And a good chunk of the time, but f man. The article says that the difference will be noticeable. They said it'd be like the difference between getting good LTE, about 50 megabits per second, and then going home to your really good Wi-Fi, if you have really good Wi-Fi, and then all of a sudden jumping up to 150 megabits per second. It's like, ooh, this is nice and speedy. Yeah. They said that that type of experience would be available on islands islands of 5G coverage in probably major cities. They said it will work good in a stationary situation, might work when walking, and would certainly switch to 4G LTE while driving. So it's like, well, why can't we? I mean, there's probably a technical reason that makes total sense why we can't access 5G at least, or it won't be, why it is said that we won't be able to access 5G while we're driving, at least not when it first comes out, but it just logically doesn't make sense. Cat, that's not your food. They said that it might be a different experience depending on the operator, though hard to peg exactly because deployments will vary by operator and by market. And big surprise here, but they're saying expect to expect AT&T's and Verizon's to be fat to be the fastest, which they already are, faster than Sprint at least. Sorry, Sprint. They did, however, say that Sprint's coverage within a city might be more predictable than AT&T's or Verizon's. They said T-Mobile is going to focus on broader coverage by going for the 600 mega megahertz frequencies first, but the speed won't be dramatically different than that of 4G. So it's like, it's kind of wasted, I suppose. They said that T-Mobile is also a wild card on two different fronts, the uncertainty of outcome and the when or if that deal between them and Sprint merging is going to happen. That could really throw some kinks into rolling out 5G effectively. And Qualcomm's Snapdragon 855 chip does not support 600 megahertz. So that's going to really f*** T-Mobile. Damn. That same chip, however, does support 2 gigabit LTE. Keep in mind that you know how back in the day when the carriers had 4G and then which is HSPA plus and then 4G LTE but a lot of times they would market both of them as 4G they would kind of leave the LTE off of the HSPA plus part we could expect the same thing to happen with 5G versus 4G LTE it could because at least in the early stages the best of LTE could be as fast as early aged early development 5G Something else, all voice servers, at least for the next few years, will use voice over LTE or Volte, Volte, Volte. And it's still a relatively new thing, so there's not a big incentive to switch over to 5G until standalone networks are built. Something that the author of this article pointed out, he's, it's going to be interesting to see how handoffs between Wi-Fi, 4G LTE, and 5G are handled. Like, oh, there's like, there's a three-way trifecta of phone having to be like, oh, Another thing is battery life. So, you know, obviously the further away a phone is from a cell phone tower, the less reception it has, the harder it has to work to get a signal, the more battery it uses to do that. But when we're talking about like such high bandwidth signals and the fact that they're not going to be that plentiful at first, and the fact that the phones are likely to have a priority for that because obviously I mean I would want my phone to look for 5G whenever possible just because it's 5G and it's faster but it is something to keep an eye out for something else that I thought of is that when 5G matures and the bandwidth gets bigger and bigger and bigger YouTube already plays a video when you hit play at the resolution based on the network speed at that time so if the network speed is total crap, then the video quality will be downgraded to like 480 or something because YouTube would rather play a video at a lower quality than have you hit play and it play something in the and it has to play another second and, then and it continues. Instead, it'll play something that maybe looks a little grainier than you prefer, but it plays smoothly. So as the network speed and bandwidth gets bigger and bigger, more and more resolutions will be loaded and played at by default, including 4K. 
Right now, I think it's dumb to record in 4K on a YouTube video, at least for stuff like this, and even for things that are a little bit more fancier, like some of the other videos that I've done that you've seen, because the phone is not going to play it in 4K unless you tell it to manually. And even then, you're gonna deal with buffering issues unless your internet's stupid fast. And what phone screen is 4K right now? Certainly not the same, not even the Samsung ones, those are 2K. And then certainly not the pieces of shit iPhones. There's a very few phones that can actually take full advantage of the 4K resolution. So making a 4K video, and since mobile is the is 90% of the consumption on YouTube anyway, it makes no sense to record videos in 4K. Actually, I take that back. The only reason why that would be viable, and I'm going a little rabbit trail here, the only reason why that'd be viable to shoot in 4K is because if I needed to, and if this was 4K, and I needed to zoom in on something, or like really stabilize the shit out of really shaky footage, I could digitally crop it in way in like this, up to like four times the magnification of it right now, and it would still look as good as 1080p. That's the only benefit to recording in 4K on YouTube. But as 5G matures, perhaps we'll start getting closer to playing that resolution natively, which would be nice. It's gonna happen, it's just a question of when. And with that, we're gonna show some appreciation to the Scotties on Patreon, the ones that pay $10 or more per month, per month, and they are. Unit Omega, Anthony Jackson, Christopher Caswell, Sin O, Nick Hawks, Eric Price, Jatinder Lal, Kyler, Robert Bitter, Spidget, Stephen Nichols, and Stuart Glover. And for the Super Beamers, the ones that pay five dollars a month are Grant Stockton with the awesome avatar. And for the Beamers, the ones that pay one to two dollars a month, those are David Larson, Alexier, Encrypted Bunny, Josh Utley, Nicholas Clark, Ramon Santos, and Roman Vranurakais. Stay broad banded and stay beaming. In an article by t <clears throat> different depending on the they said they also might have a different experience depending on the div operator, operator, operator. They said T-Mobile is going to focus on but the 600 something else, all voice but 